It's great to have you joining us on Radio Free Georgia's In Tune to Nature program. I'm host Carrie Freeman coming to you from Atlanta in February of 2023. Today, we're going to be talking about an important and very thoughtful and nuanced book, helping to tackle the trickiest ethical questions in how we treat animals in nature, especially quote unquote non native species, which we can alternately call introduced species. And when and how we should interfere in the lives of animals in the wild. The 2021 book is called Wild Souls, Freedom and Flourishing in the Non-Human World by environmental writer Emma Maris. Through interviews with people all over the world, Emma's Wild Souls book addresses core questions such as what do we owe wild animals? What's the right relationship to the non-human world? When is it right to capture or feed wild animals for the good of their species? How do we balance the rights of introduced species with those already established within an ecosystem? Should we kill introduced predators to save rare species? Can hunting be ecological? Are any animals truly wild on a planet that humans have so thoroughly changed? No clear guidelines yet exist to help us resolve such questions. Emma provides a new vision for our relationship with and responsibilities towards animals and nature in her book, Wild Souls. And she is our guest today. Emma Maris is an environmental writer and an institute fellow at the UCLA Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. She's written for many magazines and newspapers, including National Geographic, Wired, New York Times, Nature, and Outside. She has a master's in science writing from Johns Hopkins University. In 2011, she published her first book, Rambunctious Garden, Saving Nature in a Post-Wild World. In 2016, she gave a TED Talk about seeing the hidden nature that surrounds us, which has been watched over a million times. She grew up in Seattle, Washington, and now resides in Oregon. Her website is her name, emmamaris.com. That's Maris spelled M-A-R-R-I-S. So that's double R's. Welcome, Emma. Great to be here. I was going to start by kind of connecting your first and last books. How does your latest book, Wild Souls, about animals and nature, build on the ideas that you championed in your first book, Rambunctious Garden, in terms of saving nature in a world that is potentially, quote unquote, post wild? Right. So the first book was really about what counts as nature and what our goals should be when we're trying to figure figure out what to do to, quote unquote, save nature. Um I was working with a lot of new insights at the time that were coming out about uh, how much ecosystems have changed over the millennia and sort of a broadening discussion about indigenous land management before colonization. Putting those two things together, it really seemed like there wasn't some kind of perfect, pristine Eden before colonizers came to North America. And so a lot of the kind of uh, environmental goals that seem to be trying to put it back to that earlier state start, started making less sense to me. Mm-hmm. Um, they seem to be obsessing about a kind of a cultural baseline instead of an ecological or scientific baseline. Yeah. Um, so I wrote that book to really get into what counts as nature and what what our goals should be. Um, so the new book, Wild Souls, in some ways, it's, it's asking similar questions, but instead of talking about wilder places, I'm talking about wild animals. Um, you know, questions like, are animals still wild if they're really influenced by human activity or by human forces like climate change? Um, and more kind of directly, what got me interested into this question of uh, looking at animal ethics was the fact that increasingly in conservation, there's a lot of killing of animals that goes on yes. as part of saving species. Um, and this was kind of a shock to me when I when I started coming across it as a reporter, more so because so many of us who consider ourselves to be nature lovers also consider ourselves to be animal lovers. Like those two identities often really go right. hand in hand. And so the idea that in order to save nature, you have to kill animals was just really philosophically challenging and ethically challenging to me. And I wanted to get into it and figure out if there was some way to square, you know, to square the circle, to to reconcile those two goals. Uh, yeah, I'm totally with you there. <laughs> I think about these things all the time. And so related to that, before we start tackling some ethical dilemmas for wildlife, let's start with a foundational premise that you outlined in your chapter called Are Species Valuable? And you also had like an animal 
rights or philosophy chapter two by having you briefly summarize your conclusions about how to value ecosystems or, or whole species as in relation to individual sentient species like animals. Right. So in some ways, um, sort of making an argument that we should value individual sentient animals is pretty easy. Uh, it's it's essentially an extension of the argument that's been made for, you know, hundreds of years that that human life is valuable. Right. If human life is valuable, then the animals that are very similar to humans in terms of their intelligence, in terms of their abilities to remember and make plans and to experience joy, then presumably their lives are valuable too. I mean, that just seems pretty obvious. Yeah. Um, so that's that was in some ways more straightforward. Now, many of us also share a really deep-seated uh, intuition that nature itself is valuable. And that, for example, when a species goes extinct, that that's a wrong thing. Yeah. But a species isn't sentient. A species is a c category. It's a collection. It's a, it's a conceptual idea about a certain group of organisms. Now, uh, so... You know, you can imagine a situation where the way that a species goes extinct is that the very last member of that species dies peacefully in its sleep at age 100. Um, and yet that still feels like something bad happens because we lost that species. We lost that biodiversity. So in that chapter, I really tried to dig into the ethics of the environment. And there's a whole field of environmental yeah. ethics that looks at just this question of what makes the environment valuable. Um, and there's a lot of different uh, different philosophies um, that I try to lay out. I didn't totally, I have my own uh, sense of which ones are most compelling, uh, you know, but the, some of the questions, for example, are, um, are, you know, is the environment valuable in and of itself intrinsically, yeah. or is the environment only valuable to people or other sentient creatures that value it? So- right. Like, is the Aspen Grove just valuable or is the Aspen Grove valuable because we find it beautiful and because the beaver can eat the Aspen? So we and the beaver value it. Right. Um, so there's lots of different flavors of environmental ethics, and it's just a little bit less clear. And I think one of the reasons for that is that it's a, it's a younger field. Environmental yeah. ethics has only really been... Uh, an active subject of scholarly inquiry since like the 1970s. I'm sure there's some papers that predate that in the, um, yeah, but that, yeah, the, the Allo, Aldo Leopold land right. ethic, I think, or something. Absolutely. Like yeah. Yeah. Or here but in the as, West, you're right. Yeah. There's, it doesn't, it wasn't a big part of our philosophizing. Right. So I think that we're just maybe, you know, as you say, in the West, we're maybe in an earlier stage of trying to work through these, these, these kind of complex questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, I, I do think there's something valuable yeah. there. Like, I just can't get away from that sensation, even if it's really hard to put your finger on exactly how to define it. Right. And how it's it's hard because in a way we want to take like that Albert Schweitzer route, like that of total species equality, because that would be the easiest thing to do. Like all of us are valuable for living beings, whether you're a plant or a tree or a ecosystem or an individual animal. But then like when you go to resolve a conflict, that doesn't help you. <laughs> like if everyone yeah. has equal rights. So then I end up kind of, even though I don't like to value some aspects of nature kind of from a utility standpoint, I think in a way I do since I privilege sentience, you know, like of animals and including humans, I, I guess I see ecosystems as valuable as a life support system for mm. us. Right. Um, and so I guess it, that's how I would look at it when conflicts arise or when I'm making decisions or I, I would be more concerned about the life of an individual animal rather than an individual plant if I have to think of units of care because of that sentience part that you mentioned. But it's but I, I could see how someone could argue that's arbitrary and that's using a human. <laughs> you know, we're privileging sentience privileging because that's what we have, right. and, you know, but. But we also need to have these laws and philosophies work so that they resonate with us in our societies so that it inspires us to make the right choices. You know, like as, as we get into all the many issues that you tackle in the book, I like that you ask, you ascertain some philosophy in there as like a foundation in terms of making these decisions. Because also if we come at this purely anthropocentrically, then we'll continue doing a lot of what we have been doing is like, oh, is there a conflict with wildlife? Well, let's just kill 
whoever it is, you know, right. <laughs> unless it's human. Yeah. And then we need to be a little more careful these days. But um, so I, I like the idea that, you know, in the book, you show concern for animal welfare throughout and don't just say, oh, if this is good for the ecosystem to kill this species, let's just go ahead and murder them. You know, like you're I like that you express your own discomfort, <laughs> you know, some of these things. Yeah. Yeah. There are some really discomforting cases that I go through in the book where neither option really makes me feel good. So yeah, that was a tough one. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about animal species who are introduced into a new region and how to handle them if if the introduced or, you know, some call them non-native species are perceived to be problems for the so-called native or established species. And I think in your book, you're saying that a, a core underlying part of answering that tricky question is to give up the idea of maintaining species purity and some notion that there is a set and definitive way that a certain region is supposed to look and which species have historically lived there or which species are supposed to live there. Can you explain how that kind of factors in? And you mentioned that I think it comes from your rambunctious garden book too, that it's a continuing continuation of that question of do we misunderstand what the ecosystem should look like and we fight too hard to keep certain species and like, then we're being um, maybe unfair to the new species. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I think that we, you know, in North American conservation in particular has had this kind of obsessive focus on what the, what nature looked like the sort of day before, you know, the first white man stepped off the boat and, and has always sort of seen that as the goal, mm -hmm. um, you know, but of course we know that those those landscapes were already very much shaped by humans. There were millions of people living here before white men stepped off the boat. And there were, and there was a lot of really interactive land management going on. So um, uh, the idea that somehow the way that things looked like in 1491 was pristine nature is just incorrect. Mm -hmm. um, it's also the case that ecosystems just change a lot over time yeah. with or without people. If you look at North America and you look at the, Paleo, uh, paleontological pollen record, you can see that ecosystems move around a ton as the glaciers come and the glaciers go. And there's really no ecosystem in North America that's older than about 12,000 years in its sort of current, you know, s assemblage of, of major species. Wow. So, yeah, and, you know, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, well, it just so it's so it's to me that sort of takes away in some ways this this kind of moral mandate to put things back the way they used to be. And in some ways, uh, maybe that's not such a bad thing. I mean, obviously, we can still learn a lot from from environmental history. Yeah. And, you know, there's no and we can still obviously value our native species and, and want to see them thrive. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do those things at all. Um, but I am saying that when we see a new introduction, I think it doesn't make sense to immediately reach for the herbicide or for the gun mm -hmm. just right. because it's a newcomer. I mean, apart from anything else, species are currently moving around quite a bit because of climate change. And if we shoot Ew. everything that walks in the door because it's not native, we might be shooting something that's trying to find a place where it can live. Right. Uh, we might be stopping nature from adapting to climate change. So that's a real concern, I think. Right. And in your book, Wild Souls, you often interview scientists or environmentalists in island regions like the Galapagos or New Zealand because of the impact of introduced species like rats and possums come up a lot in the book, um, yeah. that that's more controversial and impactful due to the limited range you have on an island. So the yes. governments and island nations often take drastic and violent measures to eradicate introduced species that they would call invasive species. Can you share some of the ethical dilemmas there that you came across in terms of like the poisoning, the mass poisoning that's yeah. happening on some of these islands? So I'll just preface this by saying that that when it comes to quote unquote invasive species, there's some really clear patterns that sometimes don't get talked about when people talk about invasive species as just bad. Um, and one of those patterns is the difference between plants and animals. And the other one is the difference between islands and continents. Right. So plants are typically much less likely to cause an extinction, um, although they might be so, so sort of successful on an island that they could potentially exclude another plant and cause an extinction. But on a continent, that hasn't really happened. Um, and it's really where we see introduced species have the most extreme effects on ecosystems is when it's introduced animal predators on islands. Mm. That's the situation where we really do see 
you know, a new species shows up and it starts uh, finding some prey to eat and it starts trying to feed its young, all of the things that animals do in order to make their way in the world. And we can see extinctions in those cases. And we have seen extinctions in those cases in places like Australia and New Zealand, Hawaii. So the conservation uh, industry has been very interested in focusing on islands. That's where a, a huge number of endangered species are, the majority of endangered species are. And one of the most effective ways, uh, sort of by the numbers, to save them is to kill the non-native introduced predators that are that are causing them problems. And this is often rats, mice, cats, foxes, and a few other species as well. As you mentioned, possums are actually mostly eat plants, but they are very much disliked in New Zealand. I know New Zealand. <laughs> oh god. So, uh, and you know, when it comes to removing these. These island, uh, these introduced species on islands, as you say, the methods can be pretty brutal. A really common method is to use poisons, and po some of these poisons are not. That's not a good way to die if you're an yeah. animal. Yeah, I read some really upsetting. I won't, uh, you know, get into the details with your listeners, but there's some really upsetting papers about exactly what it feels like to die from these poisons, and it's not something you would want your dog or your cat to eat. Right. You just, um, I'm glad you described that in the book. So we're not just, you don't just gloss over the idea like, oh, well, you know, these rats are eating the eggs of these birds that live there. And so they're killing off the birds. So therefore we're going to poison all the rats. End of story. You're also saying like, oh, this is what happens to a rat when he or she is poisoned. And then they might die over the course of several days. And yeah. I mean, and also additionally other individuals could get poisoned you know i mean it's it's not that um you can't execute that in a precise way so it also just seems like a bad idea to put poison all over your area well it depends i mean in yeah. in new zealand where they don't really have native mammals other than bats and right. and and marine mammals they can use poisons that are specifically target mammals and they can feel pretty confident that they're not getting any um, sort of collateral damage among their native bird species and, and reptiles. And, um, but yeah, I mean, these are, these are major operations and there's, and there's, and there's large number of animals we're talking about definitely in the millions. Um, so yeah, that's just tricky. Uh, it, you know, right. it's tricky. We, we, do we want, uh, you know, endangered species on islands to go extinct? No. Do we want to have to poison millions of animals? No. So what do we do in this situation? And that's what I spent a lot of the book right. <laughs> trying to figure out what to do in that situation. Yeah. If you're just joining us on Radio Free Georgia, this is In Tune to Nature. I'm host Carrie Freeman talking with environmental writer Emma Maris about her thoughtful and comprehensive new book on wildlife ethics called Wild Souls Freedom and Flourishing in the Non-Human World. Her website is her name, Emma Maris dot com. Maris is spelled with two R's. Um, Emma, in exploring solutions to ecological issues caused by introduced species, you get back to the point challenging species purity uh, by saying that perhaps we, one of the solutions that some people say is we should al just allow the introduced species to be there, like stop trying to kill them all. And we should just allow the ecosystems to evolve and adapt, even though that might mean some like species who've traditionally been there, like birds or something, may end up dying off. Um, this is maybe it makes sense in some ways, given how extremely difficult and violent it is for humans to try to kill every individual member of a certain species and keep them out forever. <laughs> because also that seems like it's hard, like if you don't, if you kill most of the rats, but only but but not all of them, they just end up repopulating. Or you kill them and then someone brings them over on a boat one month yeah. later. You may so it's also like, do we want to commit to to constantly murdering like forever a certain species that we can't ever quite get away? So I can see the appeal, like you mentioned, of like maybe just allowing, you know, these species to create a new type of ecosystem. Can you can you speak to that? Yeah. So I mean, I think what's really important when we're talking about these hard cases is to really stress that this these decisions are are these ethical decisions need to be made on a really case by case basis and that you know it shouldn't just be one group of people like just scientists or just politicians right. making these decisions that, that this should be a broad based decision making process with all the important stakeholders at the table um 
So for, and I think that, you know, there won't necessarily be a one size fits all answer to this. Like maybe yeah. if you have an Island where that's very far away and very f- infrequently visited and it has some very rare birds on it and you can be pretty sure that if you kill all the rats they will not repopulate and you really want to save those species you know maybe you can make a strong argument for doing one round of poisoning i not everyone will agree with that but some people might might say yeah the species is more important like from a utilitarian calculation of number of lives saved or something yeah yeah birds versus rats or something yes. and like you say that it probably wouldn't happen it may not happen again the likelihood of the rats coming back is less in that right. situation but for a place like australia which which is for sort of from an ecological perspective sort of like the biggest island yeah um, because it has island problems when it comes to introduced species but it's really big yeah. um the idea of actually sort of comprehensively removing every cat or fox from australia seems like a very distant uh possibility um, and so there, there are some uh, there are some researchers who are sort of looking into this alternative idea, this idea of a sort of a new a new normal, a new equilibrium. And and some of them have hope that if you just stop killing things, that they will find a sort of a peace with each other that won't necessarily mean the end of all of the small native mammals. Um, there's a lot of disagreement about this. Some scientists think this is a pipe dream. Some other scientists think, well, no, if you stop killing dingoes and you stop killing cats, then these native animals can figure out a way to live with them. Um, so I think it's an open question. And I think it's one that each person would probably have to come to their own ethical conclusions about. Right. Um, and I don't know if this is too hard of a question for you to answer in a very short period of time because now we're running out of time. But have you come to a concluding guideline that maybe is a sweet spot in terms of like helping humans decide um, about how we can help animals in nature without overstepping our bounds and being like too domineering or controlling or unfair to them as individuals? So I think, yeah, in the book, it's like a constant struggle between that, like, should we leave them alone or is that irresponsible because we've right. messed up their environment or should we get involved or then we being unfair? It's... It, it's like a it's no tough. win situation. Yeah, I don't think there's a, a simple equation or an algorithm that I don't yeah. think there's like an ethics machine you can put these dilemmas through and get a tidy answer out the other side. Um, in the last chapter of Wild Souls, I do have some lists. I make a list of things that I think really are valuable. And those include things like individual animal lives. They also include things like the flow of energy and matter through ecosystems. Yeah. Um, and then I have another list of things that I actually don't think are valuable. And one of them is sort of like purity or the sort of quote unquote naturalness of a landscape as defined by lack of human influence. Because I think those right. ideas come from this sort of humans are the opposite of nature ideas that I think are incorrect and can be damaging and can lead to suffering. So I have a right. sort of a list of things that are valuable and the list that, of things that are not valuable and I think that by removing some of these purest ideas from the equation, maybe that makes it a little bit easier to balance. Yeah. But yeah, ultimately, like there's not just one thing right. on the what is valuable list. And so that means that sometimes you're going to be comparing apples to oranges. And that means that there's no math that can tell you the right answer. There's going to yeah. have to be some kind of judgment call. Yeah. And um, quickly, Emma, for listeners who are interested in learning more about this kind of compassionate conservation or helping animals in nature in ways that support their rights and welfare, what would you recommend in terms of like actions they could take or some awareness building, like resources? Well, definitely sort of looking in that phrase, compassionate conservation will take you to um, uh, lots of resources. Um about about that particular movement yeah um and there's also there's also a sort of a movement in the united states to to that i think is quite interesting that your readers might be interested in which is to look at the uh as animals as legal persons um and i talk about that a little bit in my chapter about about animal rights and animal welfare um and i think that that could be uh something that they could look into that's great. And then also there's, I wanted to mention a couple books that have been written. Katya Feria wrote a book called Animal Ethics in the Wild. And then Kyle Johansson wrote a book called Wild Animal Ethics. They're both uh, fairly new. And there's also a nonprofit science group working on welfare called Wild Animal Initiatives. So this is definitely a hot topic. And um, and so Emma, I 
I really, I want to thank you. Um, this is the end of our show, but I want to thank you for being with us on Radio Free Georgia's In Tune to Nature program. And thank you for writing Wild Souls and for the thorough way in which you're addressing the crisis facing animals and nature and how we humans should help in ways that are constructive, compassionate, and fair. Thanks for having me. Take care. And to our listeners, thank you for tuning in to In Tune to Nature, broadcasting every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time, online at wrfg.org and on Atlanta radio station 89.3 FM. We post action items, news, and podcasts on the show's website, facebook.com, slash In Tune to Nature. The views and opinions expressed on this show do not necessarily reflect those of WRFG, its board, staff, or volunteers. I'm one of those volunteers. I'm host Carrie Freeman asking you to please support independent, non-commercial media like Radio Free Georgia. And remember to take care of yourself and others, including other species, whether they're originally from here or whether they migrated. Thank you for listening. Cheers.